So it seems like it seems like the the, the, the questions that the points that people are wanting to to, to sort of move forwards on are um, essentially how how you define what really makes a, a protected area, right? So in, in terms of what's an acceptable protected area that you can, is a manipulated environment uh, uh, really acceptable as a protected area, um, and and associated with that. Should we be should we putting our priorities there and measuring measuring um, regions in terms of wilderness values uh, and, and and using that as a criterion for what our priorities are? So should we be should we fo be focusing on on the unspoiled uh, wilderness areas uh, and, and working on those? Should or should we allow ourselves to work on the um, on on the larger? Manipulated areas, and this is a discussion that's come up frequently, is where you know, so there's more of the manipulated areas than there are of the wilderness areas. So, um, to some extent, should we should we try and do what we can with those those manipulated areas? Um, uh, and and then and how do we um, how do we measure how well we're we're performing um, with with our work through biodiversity outcomes? Um, and um, and, I, uh, and so, and a point that Max uh, brought up, which I think relates to this, is so yeah. How do we interpret the interpret the sites that we're working on in terms of um, I mean, what do they, they really mean? Uh, and because we can't really have a, a, a sensible forward management plan to really know what the sites mean. Um, uh, and the other point that seemed to come up was so we, we talked a lot about upstream the the, the upstream connection, which we about downstream connections too, um, and that's that's a point that had come up at a, at a geobomb meeting uh, about a year or so ago, where uh, in Japan, where one of the one of the Japanese guys there was saying, well, upstream is really important um, because it has a downstream impact, um, but downstream is really important because that tends to be actually where um, where there's often higher biodiversity anyway. Um, so uh, you know we should be looking at those. That it's it's a more diverse one and richer in downstream. So we should be looking at those, and that, that should be our priority. So I guess that those are a few points and questions to throw out. Uh, the question is, what do people think? Again, what do people think about that? And then I think uh, and, and bef before we finish, the question is, what is it? What is it we do when we go away here from? If there's one thing that we when we leave this room that we're saying we're going to do this. As a group, individually, whatever. Like, oh, so, can we walk out of this room and write like, um, an opinion piece on what <coughs> freshwater conservation protected area priorities should be? That might be a question that we we need to we will revisit in the section tomorrow when we're looking more at biodiversity outcomes. But but it's something that um, it would be good to hear from you if you think like yes, we should do A, B, or C as a result. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah, one of the things that I would really like to think about, actually adding to your comment, is, is really what classes or what land uses, um, how do we define what's allowed in a protect, freshwater protected area. And the funny thing, it's, it's, it's funny that you pulled me up here because we had exactly the same discussion a year or two ago when Mabi Hermoso and I, together with WWF, did some stuff in the Congo. So in the, in the Congo, for example, we didn't allow those level six protected areas to be protected because there's a lot of logging going on in them. However, we did actually include non-IUCN protected game <coughs> reserves because I mean there's a couple of dudes with four wheel drives shooting a few deer, but most most of the catchment is actually protected. So it's just an example that it's it's not really maybe a piece could be how the IUCN categories or are the IUCN categories relevant for threshold protection. Um, to add to that, I think it's just as important to know what's happening outside of the areas, especially at the headquarters. And that, that question about wild rivers. In Australia, there was a, there was a really monumental piece of work done by James Stein at the <coughs> trying to measure deviation from or, or, or the degree to which river reaches and the Armenian river reaches. 
um, quantify the, the disturbances in each of these. And, and um, I think that's the kind of thing that we need to also be able to measure, recognizing in real protection what's happening upstream. We, we're not going to be able to have the entire catchment, but what's happen, happening in upstream should be measurable, quantifiable in terms of its, its um, impact on biodiversity, and then measure in real biodiversity too. Yeah. I just want to point out that what we call protected areas are working definition is whatever area any of the 200 and something governments in the world decide to call a protected area. Each country has its own criteria. Many times politicians just want to greenwash something, so they call it a protected area, they throw it in the map, and automatically we of the IUCN throw it on our map and treat them all equally. There are areas that are really protected, and there are areas that are called protected. To me, if you take a river and you can dam it and turn it into a lake, it's as protected as if you have a forest and you can cut it off and turn it into a grassland. If you can fish with absolutely no different rules than outside the protected area, you wouldn't call it a protected area if you could hunt with no rules, right? So is it really protected or just called protected? But I think that's, that's kind of exactly it's exactly the same problem for the rest of the marine, marine protected areas with uh, with uh, fishing licenses. Yeah. I, I do think it would be useful to, to think about when can we consider a freshwater ecosystem like a river protected um, and, and to work on that. So Because I, it, it, that, that argument about protected areas is, is, is the world over, the terrestrial ecosystems or whatever. But I think if we could pray, rephrase it and get away from areas that don't work, but, and rather think more where we want to go, which is when can we consider it for I think that would be a really useful thing that could come out here, and I really do think that condition has to be somewhere in that. Um, the condition of your river and the disturbance, even if it's modeled from wild rivers, it tells you a lot about whether you should consider a river protected or not. But, but yeah, so right. um, I think that's very useful. Think about what we want, not what we have. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, I'm th my thoughts on this are, I guess, with the with the development of the green list of ecosystems, and we have. The, I'm guessing that 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 provides some kind of mechanism to start addressing this, so we can start to say. We think about it specifically in terms of freshwater systems and how uh, uh, and a set of metrics for whether our freshwater ecosystem is. Is fitting the green criteria. Um, there are some of the few that are going to be here. Yeah, and that group is not everything. Um, a good appreciation <coughs> of this, if I think of what I would like to see 10 years from now at the next conference, is um, I think of that graph that we've seen a few times yesterday, and it's more than a memory of the, the progress in conservation over the last century. So it shows two lines, and uh, typically the number of areas or areas, and it shows it for, for marine areas and for terrestrial. Love to see a freshwater line in the graph as well. So maybe that will give us sort of help us to think of what we need you know, to be able to plot uh, freshwater protection, check the freshwater protection on the graph as well, because it's not just very Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, I think another thing that we consider is the externalities of freshwater uh, protected areas, because they're moving targets, as you were in the title of the presentation. So the effect of uh, a moving uh, like water body uh, that can damage in one spot to fast, damage some other spot, even if it's outside the protected area, it's much greater. So we have to identify also the, the threats. When you talk protected area, it's protected against what? Why do you need to protect it from? Usually it's people. Usually it's pollution, uh, erosion, and overfishing. Basically, I think those are the basic three issues. Dumps. And dams, yeah, dams. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, dams. Exactly. So, if you identify the threats, if you identify the threats and the externalities of these threats, then maybe we can uh, define faster what we mean by protected areas in terms of fresh water. Uh, 
Good afternoon, my name is Madira, I'm from South Africa. I'm working with the communities that have been residing very close to the protected areas in South Africa. What I would like to see going forward in the next 10 years is to get direct benefits to these communities that have been removed from these areas as we have proclaimed them as protected areas. Things like fishing license that will work directly to benefit these communities. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 Or um, I think the condition might be might be a good input, you know, to try to evaluate you know, how how successful our conservation efforts uh, might be. But I think that in any case, we're looking at the wrong in the wrong direction. Uh, the the primary focus of our conservation effort is actually to preserve biodiversity, among other things. Uh, if we also consider ecosystem services, but in the end, what we want is to preserve biodiversity and uh, let these species to persist in time. Uh, no, I don't think anyone has ever mentioned here anything about species. Where are the species? Um, I think that we need to think about new indicators of conservation success, uh, and probably, I don't know, the IUCN uh, conservation status of species might be a good indicator. It's probably the, the only indicator that we have right now. Uh, why don't we use that as a target? Why don't we... Um, uh, force ourselves, you know, I know that it's not easy to do probably, but why don't we force ourselves to, you know, in 10 years time, evaluate how successful our conservation efforts have been based on how many species were critically endangered today um, that are either endangered, vulnerable, or even not threatened at all in 10 years time. Uh, thanks very much for that. Yeah, uh, a quick point that crosses my mind then is, um, in terms again, thinking about like what we what we would do as a as a product from this then, uh, for for you all to think about this, is it possible then to to do a survey of how effective protective areas are for fresh waters? Um, I mean, so it's kind of it's a building on the work that the birds. Um, but, but saying, uh, doing an assessment of, of, of um, effectiveness of protected areas for conservation, for, uh, of four freshwater systems um, around the world, uh, uh, so that we can have recommendations of where they're working, where they're not, um, uh, and, and, and how, that, how that links to where the protected areas are, are, are indeed conserving species based on other criteria. I mean, maybe that's something that we need to think about as being a product of study. Yeah, Jörg. Hey, Jörg um, Freier from G1. Um, I, I greatly support this view of really focusing on threatened species. Uh, while I, I really like the, the wild rivers concept, there might be quite a, a discrepancy. I mean, many threatened species might exist in quite devastated areas, and the threats might come just then from alien species invasion, as I remember from South African national parks, which are pristine without any native freshwater fishes anymore in some places. Um, so it's, it's really not an easy game, but I, I really would focus on species. Um, I, I'm, I'm up uh, keeping a list of uh, Western Palearctic freshwater fishes. And I only can tell you, we update the number of extinct species every year. <coughs> every year we lose one or two species completely. Um, Max. Thank you, Ian. I've got um, three points I want to make quickly, or three type of issues. Who makes the, 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 um, the um, choices about protected areas? Who says they're actually um, 
effective or not, the government officials, the conservation, the scientists, or local people. I think we could get very different answers on that basis alone. Um, and the second one is, are we addressing the dry phase of inland fresh waters? Or are we only addressing the wet phase? And therefore, what does that mean for how we manage? Most of our mapping is on the water distribution, the water systems. And yet, for, for large parts of the world, many wetlands are dry for most of the time, and those areas are likely to be drier in the end of the near future. So what about the dry phase of fresh water ecosystems? And the third one, I think we need in, to go beyond the, the unthreatened or rare species concepts. But just by focusing on them, I think we're going to miss a lot, and we can lose other things at the same time <coughs> faster than we actually realise. The last point. To go beyond the, um, the unthreatened or rare or vulnerable species concepts. Now, popular species, <coughs> iconic species, are also important and can be lost just as quickly. Okay. Thanks. I saw, so we've got one minute to get, so I can do three one minute points in that. Okay, very briefly, I'm uh, Aaron Spart. Uh, also, as I said just now, I work for Cape Nature, which is a, a regulating conservation agency in the Western Cape Province of South Africa. 70% uh, of the Cape Floral Kingdom, one of the six uh, kingdoms of the world, etc., etc. My team and I are involved in the um, auditing and tracking of management effectiveness of our protected areas uh, on an annual basis. And in terms of just what I heard now, in terms of the next 10 years, it would be interesting to know that whether or not Cape Nature, my agency, in 10 years' time, following an integrated catchment management approach, with fire management, freshwater management, biodiversity and invasive alien species management, whether or not we've made a significant, hopefully positive difference to uh, river health um, and, and catchment, catchment health um, in, uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, and then there were, there were two, so Jean and um, just on the species, of, um, in New South Wales we've got all the odd freshwater species and several thousand uh, freshwater invertebrate species. Now, if you focus on species, uh, invertebrates are not going to um, figure. Uh, the other question was Max's question about who decides whether protected areas are well managed. In New South Wales we have a very um, comprehensive system and uh, set of park system where very detailed analysis is done on management effectiveness. Fresh waters don't figure at all, except for some of the floodplain wetlands. So I think that the conservation, freshwater conservation um, science or practice hasn't really reached uh, management effectiveness practices for protected areas. Thanks very much. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, sorry, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say my one thing about, so, so I completely agree with somebody who said that threatened fresh, they are, they live in such sucky rivers, they're awful rivers. So, um, so yeah, so, so definitely not, not only focusing on wild and, and, and free rivers, um, but the one thing that I wanted to make a point is that when you talk about threatened species, we often just evolved out to fish and they're not very good surrogates for other stuff. So, so I'm, I'm sort of like a little bit worried, you know, about just focusing on, on, on species. And the other thing for me is river health and river condition is a clear way for us to, manage, to, to understand effectiveness. If your river health is going down and there's an annual, there's a trend of, of it going down, then you're not being effective. If, if it's staying the same or, or improving, then you're being effective. So uh, I'd like to, I really would like to see ecological condition future more. Thank you very much. Okay, th this is fantastic, and, uh, and, and we could go on for longer, but the time has run out. But I would say then there is the follow-up session to this tomorrow afternoon. Three thirty. Thank you very much. Um, uh, on biodiversity outcomes, please, if you're uh, uh, available, do come along because I think this conversation will continue uh, in there. And I would really like to kind of think of what we. What, what we will do 
as a result of it. I'll leave <coughs> at the back a piece of paper for you to put your name and email um, so we can, uh, if you're interested in, in being part of the process of follow-up, then write your name and email down um, so as we can then have a group of people who are going to, going to do something. But this has been very, very helpful. There are some fantastic ideas um, to start thinking about. Thank you very much. Thanks to the speakers also for being so good at the time.